Okay, testing one, two, check, check one, two. Testing, testing one, two. Check one, two, testing one, two.
Welcome to the Hopkins Center. Take a moment to silence your cell phone. Also, please locate the nearest fire exit. Thank you. Welcome. Whoa, welcome to this, the sixth and concluding session, hopefully the culminating session of the summer lecture series, Our Divided Country, How to Find Common Ground. I hope you've enjoyed the series. We tried to put it together in a way that would frame what are pretty contentious domestic issues, racism, immigration, inequality, and the like. But we've tried to select speakers that would frame it in a way that make it clear and not try to be stridently uh, opinionated and, and to sell a point of view. And so I hope you have enjoyed it. You've been a terrific class, your uh, group, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, a reminder, the cell phones go off. If you have an exit early while the speaker is speaking, please use the back exits. I want to welcome the uh, Osher Institutes at the University of Vermont and at Granite State College, which are live, being live streamed into this, uh, this particular event. I want to remind you, if you have any questions, I'll be up front, as will others, to take your questions during the break. We then sort them, and, and eventually they become the source of the questions for the, uh, for the speaker after the break. And one other thing is that we, every, at the end of every survey, uh, at the end of in every series, we do a survey, and we're going to do that again. So many of you will be getting online the survey. One, we want to know what we can do better. And two, we want to know if you have any ideas for a topic for next year. Because believe it or not, in next month, we have our first meeting to begin to say, what are we going to be talking about nine months later for our series? At this point, I want to thank our uh, various underwriters, which are the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Caldwell Law, Dartmouth Coach, Kendall at Hanover, Wells Fargo Advisors, and for this particular session, a sponsor of Dartmouth Hitchcock. Could we give them a thank you road of applause? Without them, we truly would not be able to put on a first-class series. Uh, now I would like to introduce our, our int int introducer, um, who is Anne Hargraves, and she will introduce our speaker. Anne? Good morning. It is my great pleasure to introduce Susan. Whoops. Thank you. Better? It is my great pleasure to introduce Susan Denser, President and CEO of NEHI, the Network for Excellence in Health Innovation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization comprised of, NEHI, of nearly 90 stakeholder organizations from across all key sectors of health and healthcare. The mission is to advance innovations that improve health enhance the quality of health care, and achieve greater value for the money spent. Wa offices are in Washington, D.C. and Boston. Uh, NEHI conducts independent objective research and thought leadership to accelerate these in innovations and bring about changes within health care and public policy. Uh, Susan has three children, uh, two of whom uh, have or are about to attend Dartmouth. Uh, and one who decided to take the southern route uh, and study where it's warm at Elon University. It is my great pleasure to introduce Susan Denser. Thank you so much, Anne. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for that mercifully brief introduction. <laughs> and uh, good morning to all of you. It is such a pleasure for me to be back here at Dartmouth. I was a member of the class of 1977. 
went on to uh, join the Board of Trustees and actually chair the Board of Trustees here at Dartmouth for several years, as you po possibly noted from the bio. So this is always a homecoming for me, even if it's not official homecoming weekend, it's always homecoming for me. And it's particularly terrific to be back here speaking under the auspices of Osher at Dartmouth. Uh, I was on the board uh, in the days when this was known as Iliad. And of course, many of the people who were involved in, in that, in signing off on the part of the college, whether it was uh, John Kemeny, who actually inspired a lot of the development of Iliad by observing that lifelong learning is frankly what makes life worth living. Uh, then of course, John Strobain, the provost at the time, uh, was instrumental in creating it. Jim Friedman, beloved uh, president, while I was on the board. Uh, and of course, others uh, have, uh, have uh, given so much uh, to support uh, this organization, and for that, uh, I know we can all be grateful. I noted that one of the first courses that was taught at Iliad uh, was on Nathaniel Hawthorne and the Scarlet Letter. Uh, I, that was the subject of my honors thesis at Dartmouth. <laughs> and one of my professors, Ned Perrin, uh, the late, great Ned Perrin, taught that course, so it was uh, really special to see that. And then, of course, another one of the first lectures was Healthcare in America, taught by the great Tom Almy, who was on the faculty of Dartmouth Medical School and it was just uh, helped to train thousands and thousands of people who went through Dartmouth Medical School, now Geisel, over the years. So, as I say, in so many important ways, this is a really wonderful homecoming for me. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to have this. So, my topic today is unequal opportunities, as you see, and unequal outcomes in healthcare. And this really is so much in line with the theme of this summer series of a divided country. Uh, it's hard to think of, uh, 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 of course, we know we're divided in many respects in this country in so many different ways, but in the status of health and healthcare are some of the greatest divisions in this country that we've ever encountered. Now, we know the country disagrees about things like the Affordable Care Act, whether we should go to a single payer system, et cetera. That's an important set of discussions. Even more fundamentally is the differences in health status now within our country that are, if anything, growing wider. And that will be the topic of my uh, presentation today. Uh, the US is, as we know, a less healthy nation than many, many of our peer countries. And both health and healthcare are distributed very unequally with big disparities that start at birth and continue straight up through to the end of life. It's really the poor and declining health status of many Americans that we need to be increasingly focused on. In addition to discussing the other things we're going to discuss in healthcare, like, you know, should we have a single payer system? We're not. And that gets us right to the topic of the so-called social determinants of health. And I'll be explaining more about that as I go. And what we have evolved in this country is an unfortunate system where we don't pay as much attention as we should to the things that cause people to be sick. Rather, we wait until people get sick and then we throw an arsenal of very expensive treatment at them. So, Unlike many other countries, we kind of have it backwards, and I'll be expanding on why that comes to such an enormous cost for our country in terms of resources that we really could more meaningfully deploy in other areas outside the healthcare sector. So that will be, uh, in essence, my topic today. I do want to say that these slides can get a bit technical. I'm very happy to leave them behind uh, so that uh, perhaps Osher Dartmouth could distribute them for those of you who want to go back and if you actually do want to study them in the beautiful August weeks ahead, I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but if you do, uh, they will be available uh, for that purpose. So, uh, so as I say, I'm going to also focus on the fact that there are really vitally important opportunities now for us to improve health and healthcare. So this isn't all going to be a depressing presentation. I think there are signs around the country that we can make a difference, and I'll be hoping to leave you with a few thoughts about how we can do that as well. So let's start by asking how, as a nation, we stack up compared to other countries in our health status. 
it's not a pretty picture. We have the shortest life expectancy overall among all the rich countries. And you can see the long list of them over here. You can see that the uh, average of all the rich countries is 82 life expectancy. And this is life expectancy at birth, right? So this is how, how long can we expect you to live on average when you are born? Uh, here are we down at the bottom of that list at 78.8. Now you can say, well, okay, so that's what, just, just about under four years, what's the big deal? That's a huge deal across the entirety of the population to be that low on the spectrum of all the rich countries. And other various studies have uh, pointed out that if we stay on the trend that we are on now, when life expectancy gains are not materializing, that's one problem. But in addition to we're not gaining life expectancy much anymore, we're actually losing life expectancy for large components of the population. And if we stay on that trajectory that we're now on by 2030, uh, life expectancy at birth in the US will be on a par with the Czech Republic for men and Croatia and Mexico for women. And there we are uh, in 2030, according to uh, various projections. And you can see how far below other countries that we don't necessarily think of our, them, ourselves as being inferior to, right? South Korea, France, Japan, uh, Spain, Switzerland, all of those countries will have higher life expectancy than the United States in 2030, which is not that far away. Now, what's really interesting is people dig into this, they see other weird things that are happening uh, that uh, are correlated with this reality. One is that as populations get healthier, people tend to get taller. And we know this if we go to a museum and you see a costume that say somebody from the 18th century war and it's, you know, the people were this tall, right? So we know that this is what happens as populations get healthier and as life expectancy rises. Uh, in the United States, that process has come to a halt. Our population is not getting taller on average. And that is a clear sign that our health status is not improving. Uh, because height is associated with uh, greater longevity. What else, not for an individual, right, but for a population? All right, so what else is going on that we know is not uh, flattering to the United States? We have the highest child mortality rate of all the rich countries. We have the highest maternal mortality rate of all the rich countries, which means we have more women dying in and around childbirth, the childbirth episode. We have the highest body mass index of any high income country due to our high obesity rate. Uh, so these are really uh, just very clearly understood indicators of the fact that our health status is not optimal. And here's just to take a look at where we stand in terms of overweight and obesity. You can see we're all the way up there, almost at the end of the spectrum. The only other semi-rich country that is worse than we are is Mexico, which has a very high rate of obesity and diabetes, largely due both to poor diet, but also there is some clear indication that uh, uh, certain people of, of a Latino heritage have a particular problem with diabetes in the face of a poor grain heavy diet. So really, we're as about as bad as it gets with respect to overweight and obesity among the rich countries. 70.1% uh, of the population now either overweight or obese, 70.1%, okay? so. That's how stunning it is. And we know obesity is correlated with uh, conditions like diabetes. It's also correlated with cancer. There are about two dozen cancers now that have been linked to rates of obesity. So we expect to see the rate of cancer go up in this country due to the obesity issue alone. Uh, we know that more adults in the United States uh, get this way in part, obviously because of diet, but they also get this way because of lack of physical activity. We have a much more sedentary lifestyle 
than most other countries. Uh, the phrase we commonly hear now in public health is that sitting is the new smoking. It's about as bad for your health. Sorry for those of you who are sitting here today. We should all, <laughs> we should all be standing up and running around, right? Um, but sitting is the new smoking. Uh, a, a prolonged period of a sedentary lifestyle is as harmful to your health as smoking is. And you can see, oops, let me go back. You can see again where we are, that green bar relative to other countries. Um, Maternal deaths, I mentioned that a moment ago, per 100,000 live births, you can see how far above these other countries we are. And as we know, there's been a lot of important publicity around this topic recently. Uh, one of them is a wonderful series that was done by a, a joint effort by ProPublica and NPR that chronicled the problem of maternal mortality. Uh, this was a case in point. Here's Shalon Irving, age 36. She worked at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta as an epidemiologist. She died from postpartum preeclampsia. It's a form of high blood pressure that kicks in three weeks after giving birth to her daughter. This is not uncommon in America. And for a person who is in the public health field to have this happen to her as a consequence of what is a, a side effect of pregnancy and childbirth that can be caught, that can be treated, that can be monitored. She, for her to have died of this is just shocking. And it is, I say, not uncommon in America for this to happen. So what everybody who examines this set of phenomena says today is that not only do we have a high and rising set of health inequalities in the country, life expectancy has also stagnated or begun to decline for certain population groups. And that is part of what explains the fact that our average rate of life expectancy is so low relative to other countries. We particularly see this in a group of people who you would not necessarily expect to see it in right now. And some very important work that has been done by two economists, Ann Case and Angus Deaton, Angus Deaton, a Nobel Prize winner uh, at Princeton, has pointed out this problem. They have seen in their work an estimated half a million deaths that occurred, as you see there, between 1999 and 2013 due to mortality for all kinds of reasons among middle-aged, middle-aged, not older people, middle-aged, white, non-Hispanic men and women across the country. So to see this happening in middle-aged people is particularly shocking. And the biggest increases in the death rates have been among people with the least amount of education. So if you had a college education, we know that will tend to dispose you to better health over your lifetime. If you've had less than a college education, uh, and particularly the less education you have, the worse the situation gets with respect to your life expectancy. So why? Why is this going on? We see, for one, increasing death rates from drug and alcohol abuse and poisonings. We see increasing, increasing death rates from suicide, chronic liver disease linked to alcohol use, cirrhosis, etc. When people are asked what is going on with you and your health, we see them self-report these high rates of poor health, of poor mental health in particular, and inability to conduct activities of daily living. Can you actually get up and walk around very much? Often the case is no, because you're obese and you have joint issues. We see a lot of that. And that leads to increases in chronic pain and inability to work. And we see, concomitant with that, people applying in early, in, relatively early in life for disability and other things because they truly just cannot even sometimes get out of a chair and go to work on a regular basis. This is in happening today in 21st century America. Uh, now, Again, we know that a big driver of this has been drug abuse and the opioid abuse issues. But of course, it's not just opioids, it's also alcohol. 
if you look at how much uh, we lose in terms of uh, what, uh, what we, one would think of as a healthy lifespan due to this, relative to other countries, it's really alarming. This measures uh, something known as disability adjusted life years. It's a way of, sa of saying in effect, um, are you living, not only are you living long, but you're living a healthy life. This is the opposite. Are you living, are you, where are, if we're adjusting all of this for your level of disability, what do we see? This is the United States issue and how much we lose in terms of lifespan, disability adjusted lifespan due to opioid use disorders. You see that on the left, huge um, compared to the comparable country average other drug use disorders, cocaine use disorders, amphetamine, and cannabis use, right? We're ahead of all these other countries in just about every aspect of that. If I showed you the alcohol situation, it would look a little bit different because we know alcohol abuse is rampant in other countries as well. But dr this form of drug use in particular, we see uh, that we are much worse off than other countries. And we, find all around us uh, anecdotal uh, evidence, unfortunately, of how this affects individuals' lives. This was a, uh, from a series the Washington Post did uh, several years ago. Paul uh, chronicled the story of this woman. Uh, essentially, um, Aunt, you can see there Anna Marie Jones, dead at the age of 54, arguably middle age. I think it's middle age now. I think it's youth now. <laughs> um, um, High school educated, mother of three, loyal employee of Kmart. So she was actually working in the dollar store. What killed her was cirrhosis, brought on by heavy drinking. This is kind of a typical death of this group of people, unfortunately, at the age of 54. Uh, now, I mentioned that there are some other drivers as well. Gun violence. We have the highest rate of years lost among all of the well-to-do countries from disability and premature death due to firearm assaults. This is not just people shooting each other, this is also people shooting themselves. Uh, and you can see there our age-adjusted rate uh, is much, much higher than the next biggest one, which is Canada. Uh, according to the CDC, the annual age-adjusted suicide rate rose 24% from 1999 to 2014, highest rate recorded in 28 years. So we're inflicting a lot of this gun violence on ourselves personally, uh, which is really, really remarkable. Now I mentioned Ann Case and Angus Deaton, here they are, as you see on the right. What they have evolved to thinking is as they've tried to understand why this is happening, they have evolved to thinking that this is the long-term consequence of a very long, and as they say, cumulative process of disadvantage cropping up for those in our country who have less than a college degree. Life, in a word, just isn't very good for a lot of people in our nation. They lose jobs. They start off sometimes in life with poor health in childhood. Uh, what is happening in a lot of uh, areas of the country with low economic activity is that marriages are breaking down, child rearing patterns are breaking down. You've probably all heard or seen the stories of grandparents and great grandparents having to raise their kids now because the parents themselves are addicted to various substances. And even they uh, posit a breakdown of religion. Uh, churches in certain parts of the country are dying. Uh, nobody's going, nobody's participating in what used to hold communities together as uh, the, a various form of very important social glue. So into that toxic stew, we then throw the opioids crisis. And so prescriptions of opioids for chronic pain has just added, as they say, fuel to the flame. That's their description leading to what they call deaths of despair. We're seeing now many, many deaths of despair throughout the country. 
And if we look at where in particular this is happening, this is an additional analysis that was done by the Commonwealth Fund uh, based in, in, um, in New York. We can see the, the darker orange areas are where it's worse and the lighter areas are where it's less. And you can see there's less of this going on on the East and West Coast, uh, even uh, happily in New England. But there's a lot of it going on in the South, what we used to call the stroke belt um, in particular. And some, air, some states in particular, uh, uh, as you see there, Mississippi, uh, West Virginia, particularly affected by this. That's where the so-called mortality gap for middle-aged whites is the worst. But as you can see, there are many, many parts of the country that are indeed affected by it. Uh, and if we lay over that map with other maps, this is a map of the combined effect of whether you are um, uh, essentially getting heavy opioid prescriptions and participating in the labor force. This is the work of a wonderful economist named Alan Kruger, who has essentially shown that what is happening around the country is in areas where prescriptions for opioids are the highest, you have declining labor force participation rates that are the highest, which is to say, essentially, people are getting addicted and not able to work. Uh, and even people in middle age not able to work as a consequence. And you can see the hotspots, the darkest green areas are these hotspots. And that map looks a lot like the map of the deaths of despair uh, as well. So this helps to illuminate what we think is going on. Now, again, what is really remarkable is that these life expectancy gaps exist at all, that some of our population is dying in middle age at these rates. But it's also been getting worse over three decades. And if you look, if you did a map of this around the counties around the United States, you can really see it in very sharp relief. We know in about 40% of counties in America, we have a little more than 3,000 counties, and about 40% of them female life expectancy overall is actually declining, not rising. Uh, and the counties in which, as you see, life expectancy stagnated or declined, uh, essentially, it's very interesting, a number of people have said, what does this cause people to do or think in their lives? One of the pretty clear things is, and I'm not wading into this because I want to make a big statement about politics, it's really just illustrative, here, uh, counties in which life expectancy stagnated or declined over this period of the last three decades saw a 10 percentage point increase in the Republican vote share from 2008 to 2016. Uh, so we think about the messages that characterize the 2016 campaign, make America great again. Uh, uh, we're being uh, uh, essentially outstripped by China, by everybody else. We're being uh, uh, inundated with immigrants who are stealing all of our jobs. Who would that resonate the most with? People who don't see much opportunity in life. And The Economist magazine did a very interesting analysis right after the 2016 election, modeling the fact that, as you see here, if diabetes alone as a condition had been 7% less prevalent in Michigan than it is, Donald Trump would have gained a lower vote share and the state would have gone Democratic. <laughs> if 8% of people in Pennsylvania had engaged in regular physical activity or 5% lower heavy drinking in Wisconsin, Hillary Clinton would have been elected. Now, this is, we could obviously say that's probably a little bit artificial, right? But there's something magical about large numbers. And what we now have, unfortunately, is large numbers uh, to do statistical analyses like this with. So it just tells you what could be behind an increasing sense that so many in the country have that we're going the wrong way. Because frankly, for their lives and their communities, we are going the wrong way. Why would you not think that based on what is going on? So why, why is this happening becomes 
the major question. To understand that, we have to go back and talk about what really drives our health status in life. What really causes us to be healthy or not healthy? And years and years and years of research to try to untangle why do people die, say, before their normal life expectancy. If life expectancy today is 82 and you're dying at, in your 50s, what caused that to happen? And we do have a lot of literature now that has examined this over the years. We know that the biggest drivers of your health status are entirely outside the healthcare system. We know that various social and economic factors will dictate about 40% of your health status in life. Primary ones are education and income. The better educated you are, on average, the healthier you are, partly because your income is higher, you can afford to live a better life, you will live a better life, and you will probably be healthier. Health behaviors also play a role. Uh, if you are drinking heavily, or smoking heavily, or sedentary, or um, any of a number of other things that we know produce ill health, that's going to be a big driver of your premature mortality. Your genes obviously play a role. Some of us uh, are mercifully blessed with genetic components that tend to higher longevity, others less so. That's a driver, but it's shockingly less of a driver than these other two areas are. Your physical environment plays a role. Are you, did you, are you living next to a toxic waste dump or are you living in a beautiful area away from major highways, relatively unpolluted, et cetera? So your clinical care, your health care access, as you see, is at best 10%. Well, I should say, the, some of the literature says 10%. Some of the literature argues, okay, maybe it's up to 20% if you include a lot of preventive activity that is designed to kind of halt the effects of poor health behaviors, et cetera. So let's say it's 20%. It's still only 20%. The rest of it is all of these other things. And you can imagine that this pie chart is a little bit artificial because in the lives of most people, these things intersect and uh, interact. So think about somebody who is growing up in a poor area of town next to a toxic waste dump, maybe going to a school that's situated right by a major highway. We know that uh, kid, asthma in kids is worse if your school is right next to a major polluting highway. Uh, so imagine that. Imagine that you're growing up in a family where no one has had a, a, a college education you're probably not headed for a college education. That means you're probably not headed for a higher income. Uh, it's quite likely that maybe you're in a, also a, an area of town where it's too dangerous to get out and walk. And of course you can't afford to belong to a health club. So, and, and probably your, uh, the eating behavior around you is not optimal. Um, and th so these things are overlapping in the lives of many people and interacting. And of course, you may not even have access to decent clinical care uh, if you're, uh, for example, uninsured. Uh, so that is what is probably going on that is predisposing so many people in this country to poor health. It's the interaction of all of these factors. And as we go out from that basic set of pieces in the pie, we can think of the other things that play in as well. Hunger, do you have access to enough food or to healthy food? Uh, housing, do you live in roach-infected housing? Uh, which we know is going to be predispose kids in particular to asthma. Uh, what is your mental health condition? I'll say more in a moment about what we know as adverse childhood experiences that affect mental health. Do you have transportation? Can you even get to your job? Can you get to medical appointments? If you can't get to your job, you're probably not gonna have a reasonable income. That's gonna compound on everything. And if you can't get your medical to medical appointments, it's even worse. And then of course, education, income and jobs, and very importantly, isolation. Because we know that social isolation and loneliness is a huge driver of poor health. And I will say more about that in a moment as well. Years ago, some uh, public health jokesters in Canada 
uh, basically took what we all know as sort of the 10 tips for better health that you can read in Prevention Magazine or you know, every year at New Year's people say, here are the 10 things to do to be healthy in the new year. They said, let's take this and turn it into the social determinants 10 tips for better health. Uh, to help to get across why these things are so important and so really outside of the grasp of many people to effectuate. So number one tip, social determinant tip for better health, don't be poor. If you are poor, stop. Stop it immediately. <laughs> or try not to be poor for too long. Means don't have poor parents, because if you've got poor parents, you're probably going to be poor. So fire those poor parents if you're born to, into one. Own a car. That means that will be a definition of the fact that you have enough income to own a car, and also you'll be able to leave your neighborhood and get to a better place. Um, use that car if you live in a food desert, so you can travel outside of a food desert to buy healthier food. Don't live in damp, poor quality housing. Don't work in a stressful, low paid job. Practice not losing your job and becoming jobless. Be able to travel, relax, and de-stress. If you're jobless, go ahead and claim all the benefits you're entitled to. And by all means, do not live next to a busy, polluting major road or in a place like Flint, Michigan, where there's lead in the water. Now, I hope you get the point. How many of these things do we think is within the power of people in these situations to address? Right? This is the problem. We have so many people in this country living in these situations without a lot of, as they say, agency to address these things. Um, and that is part of what is driving this gap in uh, life expectancy. We see this crop up in incomes that people eventually earn. So another major study by the National Academy of Sciences looked at two groups of men and women. These were people who turned 50 in either 1980, so that meant they were born in 1930, or the people who turned 50 in 2010, meaning they were born in 1960. So if you look at those people, and you look at people stratified according to income, and we take the top fifth, the top 20% highest earners in those populations, and we compare the people who turned 50 in 1980 with the people who turned 50, the men who turned 50 in 2010, we see that the top slice of the population gained seven years of life expectancy just in that relatively short time frame. The bottom fifth of men gained nothing in terms of life expectancy. If we take the same cohort groups for women in the top fifth, they gained six years of life expectancy. The bottom fifth lost four years of life expectancy. And in the next higher fifth of women lost about two years of life expectancy. So we see this ultimately basically equate with income and the growing rate of income inequality in the country. Now, again, the social determinants weigh in here. If we say, who is the part of the population most likely to be obese? It is lower income groups. We see that here. And again, this is age adjusted prevalence of obesity by poverty level. And you can see this is the federal poverty level now for an individual at 100% of federal poverty. That's about $14,000. Four times the federal poverty level for an individual is obviously four times that. Uh, so if you look at it, you can see that as people get a little bit more income, these obesity rates do tend to decline. They're the highest in particular for people who are just above the federal poverty level, so people who are really, really struggling. Um, education is playing a big role in this. Education is very clearly linked to lifespan. On average, college graduates, as you see, live nine more years than high school dropouts live, on average. Uh, why? you're gonna have a higher income, that's clear. Uh, you also are gonna have more of a sense of self-control over your life. You're probably gonna be better informed about what not to do uh, to jeopardize your health. 
Um, and, even, and you're gonna pass those things on to your kids. Children whose mothers graduated from college are twice as likely to live past their first birthday as uh, the children of uh, women who did not graduate from college. Twice as likely. So that means you're gonna be taking better care, you're gonna know how to take better care, but you're also gonna have a higher income, which means you're probably gonna have better access to your health care. It's just all, as I say, a, a toxic stew of things that go wrong if you don't have these advantages in life. Now, why is this particularly worrisome? Because we have declining college enrollment in this country. We can see the trends here. College enrollment in two to four year institutions among all recent high school graduates. Uh, look at what's happening. Even among higher income people, college enrollment rates are declining. But they're especially declining among the low income. Look at that. Uh, line at the bottom of that graph. Now, of course, not everybody should go to college. And of course, it would be great if we had state-of-the-art trade schools as they have in parts of Europe to give people an alternative. But we don't really have that. We don't have free community college education in most of the country. We don't have a lot of options. I just wrote my, our, our first tuition check for our daughter who's coming here in September. A four-year degree at Dartmouth is now 80,000 bucks a year. Tuition, room, and board, all costs included, right? This is part of the problem. Uh, we have a, a real problem if we're thinking not just about what kind of a population we want to have of educated people, but what this is going to mean for people's health. And we can see that, as I say, particularly with respect to low-income people. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, women with college degrees, uh, not only their children are likely to be healthier, they also have them later in life. This is from a piece that just appeared in the New York Times, some research that was chronicled there. Women with college degrees have children an average of seven years later than women who don't have college degrees. Now, why does this matter? It's because what women with college degrees tend to do is spend more years working and establishing financial security for themselves and their families, which means that their kids are gonna be better off with respect to income. And if we looked at a map of this around the country, we can see just clear differences where old women are having children at later ages and where women are still having children at 19, 20, 21, 23, 24. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Biologically, it's better. But in the reality of the way we live our lives nowadays, uh, it's going to predispose women to lesser degrees of financial security. And we know, when we know that that is also coupled with a very high divorce rate in this country of about 50%, it, it pretty much guarantees that women, uh, particularly women who are less educated, are gonna end up being single parents uh, and if they haven't established uh, the ability to have a reasonable income, they will perpetuate, in effect, poverty or low income status for their kids. Now, all of that is bad enough. Here's another one. Adverse childhood experiences. What are those? Those are bad things that happen to little kids. Uh, there are forms of abuse, psychological, sexual, even witnessing. Uh, what we would think of as unpleasant circumstances, witnessing your parents fighting, witnessing domestic violence. All of those are forms of trauma that can occur in the lives of young children. And there's been a long-standing study sponsored by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente, the big healthcare system that enrolls now one out of every 30 Americans now belong to a Kaiser system uh, with 12.2 million enrollees. This long-standing study has looked at what happens to people who early in life experience one of these adverse childhood experiences. Well, guess what? More than 50 scientific articles have now very clearly established that if you were subjected to any of these adverse childhood experiences, you will have higher rates of depression, higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of lung disease, liver disease, and cancer and lower life expectancy. And when the participants in this study 
were queried about it, more than two thirds of them say they had at least one of these adverse childhood experiences, including psychological, sexual, or physical abuse. Now, why would that be? Why does this form of abuse in childhood lead you to have higher chronic illness in midlife? Honestly, we don't absolutely no, but we have some pretty strong scientific theories of what's going on. And here's what we think. Adverse child experiences uh, create what's known as allostatic load. What does that mean? We know th that anything that goes on in our bodies is driven by chemical uh, issues within our bodies, and in particular, release of hormones. So if you were subjected to any form of stress, you will immediately have a higher rate of the hormone cortisol, among others. What we think is going on is that a little kid who's experiencing one of these adverse experiences has a flood of cortisol coursing through his or her system along with other stress-related hormones. That disrupts the brain development of children, which as we know is particularly important in the zero to three age group, but also three, four, and five. So this surge of hormones in your brain is affecting your brain development. It leads to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Uh, you grow up, you don't have a sense of agency, you don't feel much in control. Your learning is compromised because your brain is compromised. You're more disposed to adopt unhealthy behaviors like smoking, drinking, et cetera, et cetera. You encounter, therefore, disease, as well as social problems, and that leads to early death. That's pretty much what we think is probably uh, happening. And there are a lot of scientific studies that are looking now at the, just the basic effect of these hormones on the cellular level that suggests that that is the process that plays out. So let's think about how this plays out in the life of an individual. This is from a study that was done a few years ago by the California Health Foundation. They actually profiled this individual. They did not uh, use his name for obvious reasons. But it was a 40-year-old guy. He had been born into a family where his mother was uh, an alcoholic, so he was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. He had developmental delays because of that. Uh, and by the time he was 40, he was obese and he had all the things that are often correlated with obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, he had asthma, probably something going on with poor housing earlier in life, and chronic low back pain. Back pain. He had been a victim of childhood abuse. He therefore suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and bipolar, bipolar disorder. He lived in public housing, again, probably, you know, possibly roach infested or what have you. He was unemployed, he was covered by Medicaid, over the course of the prior year, he had gone to see a doctor 23 times. He had missed 10 other appointments because of lack of transportation. He had phoned the primary care clinic a bunch of times. He had shown up in the emergency department 21 times, and he was admitted into the hospital three times for issues that could have been treated by primary care doctors if he had been able to make it to his appointments. Now, I tell this story because this story is replicated millions of times a day in America. And you can see that the roots of it lay way, way, way back in a little baby being born into a family where the mother was addicted to alcohol and he was subjected to abuse as a kid. And you see what happens to this day with people in this situation. <clears throat> we finally intervene when they're really sick and we intervene in the healthcare system. And that is not the smartest way to run the railroad. So let's think more about how this plays out from a national perspective. As we know, we are the country that spends the most per capita on healthcare of any other. You can see this is the uh, figures that are collected by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. This is 2016, the latest available data. You can see that green bar. We're close to spending $10,000 per person per year on healthcare. And look at everybody else. Look at the 
average of the, uh, t the 35 countries that the OECD is, is compiling here, uh, which is right that red bar in the middle, and then look at us and look at the gap. Look at the gap. We spend 25% more per capita than the next high spending country, which right now happens to be Switzerland. Anybody been to Switzerland lately? Seen all those starving Swiss uh, <laughs> without access to uh, great health care? You know, they have terrific health care in Switzerland, uh, certainly comparable to anything we have in the United States, and they're spending 25% less than we are, and insuring everybody. In fact, there's a law in Switzerland that says you have to have health insurance in Switzerland, and they all, everybody uh, essentially complies, and yet they're spending 25% less than we are. Why? Well, we know there are a lot of reasons why we spend so much. Interestingly, it's not because we use more health care than other countries. We don't go to the hospital more than they do in Switzerland. In fact, we go less. We don't go to doctor's offices more than they do in Switzerland. In fact, we go less. What is driving health care expenditures is, interestingly, things that don't particularly lead to much health care or health. Administrative costs. 8% of our health spending, it goes right out the window to administer the very complicated system that we have versus a range, as you see there, of 1% to 3% in these other countries. We also spend more because we pay higher prices for almost everything. Almost everything. Now, we all know there's a lot of attention to the high prices we pay on average for pharmaceuticals. That's part of it, but it's only part of it. And our spending on pharmaceuticals is higher than other countries. But that's not all. Our salaries are higher. We pay our doctors more. We pay our nurses more. We pay our hospital CEOs more. Everybody in the system gets paid much more in the United States than other countries. Uh, and you can see the, the average, just if we take general physicians, these are primary care physicians, you can see what the range is in these other countries. And even the, uh, the next highest spending countries are essentially uh, earning, you know, physicians are learn, earning about a third less than they are here. Why? Why? Why have we let this evolve? Because we could for a while. We thought we could pay everybody better. There's a reason why healthcare is now 18% of the GDP. It's a great producer of jobs and incomes for people in this country, but we pay a price for that. Uh, and what's really interesting is that even though we have a relatively low rate of uninsurance, that is to say lack of health insurance relative to other countries, or I should say we have a high rate of uninsurance relative to them, uh, we're still spending as much as we are. So you can see, on average of these, all other countries, almost everybody is insured, right? Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to flick that. We're the one down at the bottom of the pile, and yet we still have this uh, high rate of spending overall per capita. So how can this be? How can this be, or why can this be? One set of analyses has looked at what the U.S. spends on health care versus what it spends on various amounts of so-called social spending. And this is a big category. Uh, it can be a lot of expenditure on education. It can be expenditure on helping people uh, have uh, adequate housing. It's, as I say, a big, big bucket. Most countries spend, relatively speaking, twice as much on social spending as they spend on health care roughly, on average. We spend twice as much on health care as we spend on social spending, on average. So we have it kind of backwards. And you can see there's the US spending about half as much on social spending as we are in health care, whereas other countries, by and large, are doing the other thing. Not all. There are some that are doing it the way we are. You can see a, a couple. Canada is closer to us than many other countries. Uh, Korea, et cetera. But the bulk of countries are spending more of their money on social spending. Here's another way to look at this. If you add what we're spending on health care and social spending together, we're spending t in the totality about what other countries are spending. A little bit more, 
Um, and it, that's the graph on the right here, the 29% of net social expenditures. So that's everything we're spending on health and social. It's 29%. Switzerland is at 22%, adding both things together. Uh, France is at 31%, adding both things together. So we're not an outlier in the totality of what we spend. We're an outlier because we spend so much of that in healthcare. That is our real issue. And when we ask, do we get our money's worth uh, because we spend so much of that in healthcare, it doesn't look good. Uh, this is something known as the health impact pyramid that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has created to help us understand how we get the biggest bang for the buck in improving health. The number one thing that we get the biggest bang for the buck from is if we address these socioeconomic factors. If we address poverty, education, housing inequality, income inequality, that gets us the most health. Uh, that's why it's at the base of the pyramid. Next thing that helps is if we change the context in which people are living their lives. So if we don't have people living in food deserts, or we don't have people living where the only restaurants in town are fast food places, or if we have, uh, have uh, tobacco-free spaces. If we change the context, we can also make people healthier overall in a very important way. Then you go up the pyramid, things that still help but are less effective than the things at the bottom of the pyramid are healthcare-related interventions that are preventive. So making sure all kids have their immunizations. Uh, making sure that we give people smoking cessation therapy. Making sure everybody uh, at age 50 gets a colonoscopy. That helps, but it's less effective than things at the bottom. Then we get to clinical interventions, which is, okay, you've already got high blood pressure. I put you on blood pressure medication. You've already got high cholesterol. I give you a statin. That helps, but less than the things at the bottom of the pyramid. And then we get to the least healthy thing of all, the least impactful thing of all, I should say, which is counseling and educating people. You know what? You should stop being obese. <laughs> you know what? You should stop being poor. <laughs> That's almost the least effective thing that we can do. It's not at the top of the pyramid because it's so important. It's the least important, and it's the least effective. But that's where we put a lot of our energy. So this is really what our system is all about. And any number of people look at this and say, the status quo is just unacceptable. We cannot be running our country this way. What if we wanted to do it differently? What if we wanted to advance our health instead of letting this process play out so that by 2030, on average, women are living at the rate of uh, women in Mexico and Croatia, and men are living at the rate, or life expectancy at the rate of the Czech Republic? What if we wanted to stop this uh, horrible trend, what would we do? We would start making investments at that bottom of the pyramid that the CDC posed. We would tackle adverse childhood experiences, number one. We would guarantee early childhood education. We would make sure that kids zero to three had the kind of brain development, you've all read stories that basically correlate uh, how many words kids hear from zero to three with their cognitive development later in life. We would be making those kinds of investments. We would be expanding access in this country to healthful food. We would basically be disincentivizing sedentary activity and incentivizing activity, physical activity. We'd be enacting policies to raise incomes especially among those least well off. We would be battling substance use disorders much more so than we're doing now. And we would be expanding health insurance coverage and reforming our healthcare system because for better or worse, that's where we're providing assistance to people who are already adversely affected by these other things. So let's just reflect a moment how much of this we think we're doing as a country now versus what we could be doing. And what is really hard for people who are in this field to understand is why we systematically reject the evidence, which we do. 
Jim Heckman, another Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago, has done a lot of studies to show that policies that shape early life environments for kids, especially early childhood education, do improve health. They do. Um, and that early childhood interventions that are designed to do this uh, can promote health. It's not guaranteed. A lot of things have to happen successfully in life for people to be healthy. But if you don't start with some of the basics, you're never going to get people on the road to better health. So he's argued for years, as have many of, of people who uh, are his followers, we need to invest in these things. We need to have mandatory nationwide early childhood education. And we don't. We don't. And we need to recognize, especially in this day and age, that parents on the lower end of the income spectrum need help figuring out how to raise a healthy child. They just do. Uh, maybe it was different back in the day when everybody was living in communities and had support of grandmothers and things like that. But that's, these days are gone. So what is going to step in to help educate uh, lower income parents in particular on how to raise a healthy kid? Uh, these are the kinds of policies that we need. What are we doing? The opposite. We rank very low on our in public investments in early childhood education and development. You can see there we're 25th among the richer countries. Um, and we're, the, we're continuing to decline relative to those other countries since uh, this data was produced several years ago. Uh, so there we are, number 25. Uh, we should invest in housing, for especially for lower income people. Uh, we know that the nation is in the midst of a terrible and growing affordability crisis, especially in major cities. Uh, are we doing enough to provide affordable housing for people and healthful housing for people? No. Now, what is really um, inspiring is that some healthcare systems are recognizing this. There's a very big uh, Catholic, originally a Catholic-run healthcare system called Dignity Health, largely on the West Coast, which has now started to take some of the proceeds, their investment funds, and actually create a loan fund to enable developers to create healthier housing. They've done that. Boston Medical Center has done something similar in Boston. Uh, the Mayo Clinic is helping to finance the largest community-based assisted housing program in the state uh, of, of uh, Michigan, excuse me, Minnesota. Uh, so we know that there are even healthcare systems that recognize that housing is going to be as an important adjunct to health as almost anything they could do within their own walls. Um, and because we continue to get evidence of the relationship between incomes and life expectancy, we know we have to address incomes. This is some work done by a wonderful economist named Rod Shetty, who did this massive study where he linked 1.4 billion tax records uh, and mortality data among individuals over a course of, of uh, almost 15 years, and just very clearly showed this correlation between incomes and life expectancy. The higher your income, the higher your life expectancy. But what is also interesting is he showed that it is not exactly the same correlation from one community to another. And you can see this in these lines, these graphs here on the right. The situation in Birmingham, of the, Alabama, of the link between incomes and life expectancy is different from that in Cincinnati, which is different from that in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is different from that in Tampa, Florida. Well, why would that be? Honestly, we don't really know, but what Raj and his colleagues posit is that there's probably something else going on in those communities that is either arresting this correlation or influencing in some way. So what that tells you is that there's a very hopeful piece of this, which is that policies at the local level matter. It's not foreordained that we're going to subject everybody who's low income to poor health. We could do things to make things better. And some communities, for whatever reason, are doing that. That is the hopeful message. So what could those be? 
a higher minimum wage. The federal minimum wage is seven bucks, just over seven bucks an hour. Imagine working a, a full-time job paying seven bucks an hour, and that is the prevailing minimum wage in most of the states of the union. Uh, if you work 40 hours per week, 52 weeks per year gives you $15,000. You are just sitting above the federal poverty level at that level of income. Uh, you are guaranteed, if you can afford housing, you are probably spending 70% of your income on housing. 70%. Okay, what would we do? We could raise the minimum wage, as many communities have done. We could ex expand the, the uh, so-called earned income tax credit, which is a way where we essentially give income back to people who are working. Uh, there are proposals servicing for something known as a universal basic income. I won't go into that now, but that's a, there's a popular book out on that subject now. We, maybe we can talk about that more in the discussion period. So there are things that we could definitely do. And are there places that have already done this? Yes, there are. Uh, there are places like Buncombe County, North Carolina, which is where Asheville, North Carolina is. Uh, in 2013, they won a prize from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for having a quote-unquote culture of health in the community. What did they do? First, they enacted a living wage ordinance, 13 bucks an hour. The rest of the state is still at 725, so a very substantial increment over what is prevailing in the rest of the state. They, they said we can start by, we're gonna start improving childcare in the community, but we're also gonna start improving the food that is served to kids who are in childcare and much, much, much more. And if you go on the Robert Wood Johnson website, you can read more about what they have done as well as other communities that have won this culture of health prize that the foundation gives out every year. Um, if we look around, we see other examples where communities have come together. We see in Atlanta something known as the Atlanta Regional Collaborative for Health Improvement, nicknamed Archie, where in effect a large group of stakeholders came together and said, we don't want to be the place that disposes people to low income and high levels of mortality. We want to expand health insurance coverage, even in a state that has rejected expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. We want to change the way the local health care providers are paid, so they're not just incentivized to treat people excessively, so they're actually incentivized to make people healthier. We want to invest in a lot of in interventions in the city and surroundings that we know are going to improve health. We want to help people quit smoking. We want to help people avoid uh, drug and alcohol abuse, et cetera. And we want to in launch something that they call Pathways to Advantage. We want to basically capture money out of the healthcare system and funnel it back into improving people's incomes so they need less healthcare over time. Uh, very dramatic uh, and very bold set of initiatives that they've undertaken. Uh, I'm here to tell you they're all making really slow progress really slow progress by their own admission because it's hard to get everybody on the same page. It's particularly hard to get healthcare systems to agree to give up income. Just, just a tip. Um, but that's what they're working on. They're not alone. Out in San Diego, there's another big commission, uh, coalition, excuse me, called Live Well San Diego, which has had a 10-year plan. They're about halfway through their 10-year plan now to improve the well-being of residents in the entire county. They created a big backbone organization, which is the, the local health department. They've got 100 partners involved in this effort, including a lot of the hospitals. Um, they started by saying, is our county budget shooting the money to the things that we know we need to invest in? Is it going into early childhood education? Is it going into affordable housing? Um, they, said no, so we, we need to shift some of our resources around. They decided that they had a very bold goal. They want to make San Diego a heart attack free zone. <laughs> heart attack free zone, which means a lot of things, including combating obesity, among other things. Getting people to quit smoking. They want to create tobacco free neighborhoods. 
They want to address violence in the community. They want to make it safer for people to get out and walk at all hours of the day and night. And they want to increase the resilience to disasters because, of course, California has to worry about now earthquakes, forest fires, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, of course, potentially even terrorism. So a very bold agenda where they are pulling together the combination of local resources and, ad, and uh, directing them to important uses, as well as some grant money that they got from the CDC and uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation to do that. This is what it, it takes. It takes villages writ large of people deciding that the status quo is not acceptable. Many health care institutions, as I said earlier, have awakened to this. I mentioned the example of the ones that are investing in housing. Here is a whole group of organizations that have started to think of themselves as what is known as an anchor institution. An anchor institution is, as you would think, an institution that plays such an important role in the community that it's kind of an anchor. It either employs a lot of people, it buys a lot of services in the community. Uh, think Dartmouth-Hitchcock, case in point probably the biggest employer in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, that's an anchor institution. Anchor institutions can do what they do in healthcare, but they can also do everything else they do in a way that improves health in the community. One very important example, Kaiser Permanente out in California looked at the fact that they're a big purchaser of services in the community. They buy landscaping services. They buy food for the hospital, et cetera. Well, how do they make those purchases in a smart way? They decided one of the things that they should do is help local organizations stand up small businesses that employ the hard to employ, either people who are ex-convicts in some instances or immigrants they created small landscaping companies, and now Kaiser Permanente buys its landscaping services from those companies. Why? Because that's going to lead to a healthier community if people are employed and earning incomes. So this notion of an anchor institution having an important role is starting to pick up steam as well. Out in Toledo, Ohio, another big health system, ProMedica, done exactly the same thing. They asked themselves, a couple of years ago, how are we doing as a producer of health in the community? We're a huge economic engine in this community. How are we doing in terms of commuting health? We've got 332 sites. We've got 13 hospitals. We've got these surgery centers. We've got 15,000 employees. How are we doing? Well, the city was rated 99 out of 100 in terms of the Gallup Wellbeing Index. 70% uh, of our adults are overweight. 36% uh, of the people in the community are worried about having enough food. We're 69th out of 88 counties in Ohio for health outcomes. Hmm, what's wrong with this picture? They started to ask themselves. A lot, they concluded. So what are they doing? They got a big grant from a, a, a wealthy a local person they built this center you can see up there in the left in a uh, very low income neighborhood. They brought in a healthy food supermarket and upstairs they have an entire training facility where they're teaching people not only how to eat in a healthful way, but they're also tr uh, training people to be food service workers and even to work in high end restaurants because uh, there are some in Toledo and more, and they're doing all these other things that you can see there, including financial literacy classes, teaching people how to manage their money, parenting classes to teach people how to uh, bring up their children. This is a health system taking this on, stepping in because the community, frankly, hasn't stepped in to do this and recognizing that there's a need and that if they really are gonna call themselves a health system, they better do what they can to improve health. So I hope this leaves you with a sense that we're on a very regrettable road in this country, but it's not inevitable. There is a lot that is being done in some communities, and there is much more that can be done. And in our very complicated federated system where we've got the federal government, we've got the states, and then we've got localities, 
we need to pull a lot of different levers. We need local communities to own these issues. We need states to own these issues. And we sure as heck need the federal government to own these issues. Because do we want to wake up in 2030 in a country where these disparities are even worse? I don't want to, and I suspect you don't want to either. And as we reflect back on things that people have said over the years, Martin Luther King, having once said, of all the forms of inequality, justice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And of course, he was saying this in a context where just in the early days of Medicare, hospitals in the South were refusing to treat black patients because hospitals weren't integrated till the federal government said, hospitals must be integrated or we will not pay for people to be treated there under Medicare. So healthcare inequality was shocking to Martin Luther King and others. I think today we could just say health inequality is one of the most shocking and inhumane aspects of our contemporary life in this country. Davida Cody was a great physician activist who just died a couple of months ago. And sh this woman was phenomenal. She had treated refugees in Latin America and Asia. She had gone to Nigeria in the midst of catastrophic famine in the 80s to draw attention to that. She had participated before that in the eradication of smallpox around the world. And then when she got into her 70s, she wasn't done, she moved out to the West Coast and she started to treat substance abuse in the Bay Area. Just a phenomenal person. What she said is the obvious, which is you got to be really far-sighted to go into public health, the area that she was in, because there's no instant gratification. It takes a long time to make a difference. You have to keep your eye on the ball for a long period of time. That's what we need to do as a country. Get our eye on this ball and stick with it. Uh, to make a difference. You know, other cultures that have occupied our landscape understood this and understood their responsibility to do things, not just to make life better for themselves, but for subsequent generations. And the great law of the Iroquois Confederacy was, in every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decision on the next seven generations. Now, let us just ask ourselves how often we think our contemporary Congress <laughs> is asking that question on almost anything that it has decided over the past year. A big tax cut, uh, rejection or allowing us to get out of the Paris Acc Climate Accord, right? Really? Has there been any thinking even of the next generation, let alone seven generations down the line? I don't think so. Now, for people who want to get cynical, and many of us are, for all good reasons, prone nowadays to be cynical, remember what James Baldwin, the great uh, essayist and uh, novelist, wrote, those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by others who are doing it. So if you think you can't have a heart attack free zone, go out to San Diego and see what they're doing. If you think you can't have affordable housing for people, go ask the Board of Trustees of Dignity Health why they're investing in healthy housing, right? Those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by others who are doing it. And the great Mahatma Gandhi, to me, said it all. We all have to own this of responsibility. We must be the change we want to see in the world. And if we can't do it in the world, we could at least start here in the United States of America and make America healthy again. Thank you very much. It was a delight to be with you. All right, we want to save lots of time for our questions, so please be back here at quarter to 11.
coffee, yeah. I'm trying to stay off the cookies. If there had been carrots and celery, I would have indulged. <laughs> trying to practice what you preach, huh? You bet, boy. You bet. It, it gets harder as you get older, as you know. important thing is not to let them in the house in the first place. That's my downfall also. My daughter happens to be a great baker. So what the only upside of her going off to college is that there will have to be fewer good things to eat around her. Okay, welcome back everybody. We've got a lot of good questions today. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to getting through the stack. Uh, first thing is lots of people have asked for copies of the PowerPoint presentation and if you are interested in obtaining that please uh, check with the office and just get your name on a list and then Lisa will be sure to get out uh, the slides to you okay let's get going regarding the increases to health via increasing wages, do you have an example of market-based wage increases instead of minimal wage increases by government dictate? Hmm. Yeah. Well, a, a great question. And um, an issue, as we know, uh, and this gets into some sort of complicated economics that we frankly don't really understand is, as you know, even now we have a pretty high rate of growth of gross domestic product. So in the overall numbers, it looks like our economy is doing really well. We're not seeing wage gains that have occurred in the past with commensurate rate of growth of economic activity. And this is one of the big mysteries of our current economic uh, environment. Uh, there was a lot of discussion even uh, around the tax cut, for example, that was enacted in December. And the supposition was that as companies, as we had a large corporate tax cut, companies would uh, turn around and reward workers by raising wages. We know that hasn't happened. By and large, what companies have done is bought back shares. So they've, they've rewarded some people. They happen to be investors, not workers. And the question is why? Why? Because this isn't the way things happened in the country in the 50s and 60s, where we had high-performing economy uh, over various periods. We, we had productivity growth, which led to rising wages. So not to put too fine a point on it, but the market isn't quite working at the moment the way we would have thought it would be working. And it particularly isn't working for people at the low end of the income spectrum. Uh, now, it's working in the sense that people uh, wages are low for less educated people because there are a lot of them, right? And you can hire people uh, who uh, just, just to serve fast food and not pay them very much because it's not a particularly demanding occupation. And so the issue is how do we get out of this cycle where wages aren't rising as fast as they might even for well-educated people. Um, wages are certainly not rising at the bottom end we have a lot of low, low educated, less skilled workers. We need to get people more educated and have higher skills. And then we need to somehow address this whole complicated equation of rising productivity growth leading to rising wages. We know the market's not working right now. So what do we do? This is the big, uh, a big question for our country. I think most, most economists who've looked at this say a, an ingredient probably could be a higher minimum wage, particularly in a context where you have a full employment economy, which we pretty much do now. That, uh, you know, that the, the, the supposition has been if you raise wages, companies will hire fewer people. In a full employment economy, that won't happen. Companies need people. So basically, by raising the wages, what we would be saying is, folks, we've got to pull a little bit out of company profitability right now and give that back to workers for the sake of our economy. That's really the argument. 
Now, could we do this in a market-based way? Yes, that would be fabulous. Anybody got any ideas? <laughs> you know, um, should we, it, it, all the predictions about what would happen with the tax cut raising wages haven't occurred. Should there have been some sort of man, you know, mandate attached to the tax cut that corporations had to raise wages? That would have been an amazing amount of governmental intervention in the economy that we wouldn't have tolerated. But what's the alternative? So this is just a really, uh, really important uh, issue. And I think if we reflect back on the whole history of the country, we know certain things. We know that areas of the country where there have been a lot of investment in education have tended to do the best economically. We know that right now there's a reason why young people are flocking to cities like Boston, like San Francisco, like New York. It's because the jobs are there and it's because the education is there and life is more vibrant uh, and there are spin-offs out of universities. Uh, people tend to congregate in areas where there are people like them, and if they're innovators and entrepreneurs, they want to be surrounded by people who are coming up with interesting thoughts and ideas. Um, so we know that if we invest in education, life gets better for a lot of people. So even though it's a long haul, you know, you don't reap these kinds of returns overnight. I mean, one of the reasons why Boston is booming right now is, of course, that Harvard was created there in the 1600s, right? It can be a long haul, uh, but not just Harvard. It's obviously Harvard, it's Boston University, it's all of the educational enterprise. It becomes a vibrant community. It undergoes ups and downs, as it clearly did as the rest of the economy has done uh, throughout the course of history in the United States. But right now it's booming and it's hard to disentangle, uh, you can't really, I think, disentangle the role of education and investment and all of that. So are there, the final answer is, are there market-based ways of doing this? Yes, you invest in the things that lead to a healthier economy, you invest in education, you invest in infrastructure, and then over time it pays off. And that's really what we have to do. And one of the great sadnesses for many of us who live in Washington right now is watching just the, the past year. What, so, you know, again, politics aside, we had a big tax cut that passed. There's been an ongoing debate about an infrastructure bill that has gone nowhere. Um, we need, know we need to invest in infrastructure. There hasn't been one iota of discussion about an early childhood investment set of policies, right? And so you just sort of step back and say, we are doing nothing to create the preconditions for the market to take over now and lead to the kind of economic growth that we've seen historically that will raise wages. And that's where I think we really have to do some fundamental deep thinking about what to do next. We have a similar question kind of coming from the other side. And it says, the large problem of health inequality requires government programs and funding. Does the prominence of NGOs and nonprofits encourage some parties to hold the position that government is the problem and non-government actors could do it better? Yeah, right. Well, <clears throat> so I, I come from a very old-fashioned way of thinking about government which uh, has been paraphrased as government is the name we give to the things that we decide to do together, um, as opposed to they, <clears throat> you know. I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of people in America think of government as they or them, and there are those of us who think as government as us and we, uh, and you know, that's frankly what our democratic republic was predicated on, I believe. Uh, and we know that there are certain things that we can do together better than happen individually. And we know there are a lot of things that unless we do them together, they don't happen individually. And one of them is, is essentially public spending, right? I mean, we know that uh, bridges get built and highways get built and, uh, and public education enterprises get built because we decide to do things together. and that. You know, 
uh, the whole issue of expecting a, say, an individual company to make the commensurate investment in infrastructure or education or whatever is crazy. I mean, we have to do these things together. And what's our mechanism for doing that? It's electing people to office. It's agreeing to tax ourselves and pool our resources and then do it. So I don't know how you get around the notion that a certain amount of this really has to happen at the, and whether you call it government or whether you call it the things that we agree to do together, that's what has to happen. Now, in our country, as we've known since de Tocqueville came and pointed this out to us, we do have this amazing voluntary capacity that does still make us the envy of other countries. Because Americans have decided sometimes the things we have to do together, we will do outside of the governmental context. But by the way, we are still doing them together, right? As volunteers, et cetera. And I think there's a lot, obviously, that can and is historically done in complicated ways in this country. Sometimes it's completely voluntary. Sometimes it's federal grants and contracts going to nonprofit entities to uh, supply services. We probably need all of that. And, and I don't think we're in a situation in this country where we can pick, we're gonna do it one way only or the other way. I think we're gonna, we've historically done it all these ways. We've done some things at the federal level. We've done some things at the state and local level through the tax taxing ourselves and agreeing to do them. And then we've done some things because voluntary entities have arisen to do them. And sometimes there's intermingling between the two and we send checks to voluntary entities or nonprofits to do them. I don't see that we're ever gonna get out of that. And, and I think a, a real fundamental problem is the constant denigration of government as if it is they. Uh, and particularly, I have lived in Washington, D.C. now uh, for a grand total of about 40 years of my life. I have met some of the most committed, intelligent, dedicated members of the civil service that you would find any place in this country. And to see a systematic denigration of those people is painful. And we've got to turn this around, and we've got to begin to recognize the important role of government and not denigrate it. And, uh, and I think it starts with all of us starting to talk about the things we do together, not they. OK, those were the philosophy questions. Okay. Now we'll go to the specifics. How do researchers expect the expanding of marijuana legality to affect the many outcomes we are now experiencing? Oh boy, this is a really sobering one. Um, I'm on the board of something called the Public Health Institute, and we uh, have debated this over and over again. Um, I, I will speak from a very personal perspective. Uh, I think uh, we're going down a very dangerous road in, le in legalizing marijuana. Um, I understand all the arguments. Uh, I've heard them ad nauseum, including from my children, <laughs> who think uh, legalizing marijuana is the, one of the greatest things that's ever happened. Um, you can guess where that leads. Um, I think we know, we know enough about the effects of marijuana on the brain, and particularly on the brains of developing adolescents, among others, to know that it has negative effects. Uh, and what we've essentially done is now created uh, a, a legalized route for that to happen. It, the, it is almost, it is, you know, we know tobacco is still legal. Um, it's almost as if uh, we, had, we knew everything we now know about the harms of tobacco and still decided to make tobacco newly legal today. You know, who would do that, right? We're trying to stamp out tobacco smoking. Marijuana, we know enough about the harmful effects of, of marijuana. Nora Volkoff, who's the head of the National Institute for Drug Abuse, can show you the brain studies that she has done, brain imaging studies of what the effect is of marijuana on, the, on infants developing in utero of maternal marijuana smoking, um, et cetera. So why we're doing this uh, as a country is a real head scratcher. And then we have, of course, the separate set of concerns is, is marijuana, in effect, a so-called gateway drug? If you start with marijuana, do you 
go on to use other things? And the answer is yes, in some instances people do. It's not a guarantee, but it is possible. So I, I have to say on balance, I think we're gonna look back at this at 20 years from now and a lot of public health research is gonna be done showing that this was a really dumb idea, uh, but there we are. We've got a couple of questions on nutrition. Uh, the uh, we are what we eat and big corporations manufacture our food for their profit, not our health. Uh, also, the lack of nutrition education and doctor training. Can you speak to that? Uh, simple answer, yes <laughs> to both. Uh, we do know things are getting slightly better. Um, I, I, I personally know people who work for some of the large food companies. Uh, Indira Nui, who just stepped down, Indira Nui, who just stepped down as the CEO of PepsiCo, led a knockdown, drag out fight within that company to start to shift PepsiCo's offerings to healthier food. Um, she got a lot of resistance within her board as well uh, as internally within the company. Now, are they producing, you know, the equivalent of a bottled celery and carrots today at Pepsi? No, uh, but they took a lot of calories out of the uh, manufacture of sodas. Uh, tastes are changing in the country as well. That's helping the process. Uh, and that, so that's just one example of a food company that is adapting to this reality and feeling a sense of responsibility because as we know, um, one huge driver of obesity has been high calorie sugary sodas. Uh, in fact, if you drink one can of Coke a day, ex just add a can of Coke a day extra to your diet for a year, you will weigh 15 pounds more a year from now um, because it's that much sugar content in a can of, of regular Coke or regular Pepsi. So some companies have been acting responsibly. I think we will see more of that over time. Um, public pressure uh, will continue to matter and keeping up pressure, shareholders keeping pressure on companies to move to healthier food supply uh, is important and, uh, and regulation is important, frankly. I mean, compelling companies to disclose calorie content of foods has been a really important uh, part of what we've done as a country. As you know, one provision of the Affordable Care Act mandated that chain restaurants show calorie content on their menus. Evidence is kind of mixed about how much that helps people change their, what it is they buy. I know it's changed what I buy when I walk into a chain restaurant now and see what the calorie content is. So we're gonna need a lot of these additional interventions over time to continue to move the food supply. The second part of the question I've now forgotten, Anne, what was the, it was, um, Okay, well, you, you get the gist of it anyway, okay. Uh, well, there's, there are a couple questions on personal responsibility. Thank you. There are a couple of questions on uh, personal responsibility. And this one says it very clearly. Why do I often feel that I lack compassion for people who bring on most of their own illnesses by being irresponsible about their own unhealthy habits, such as morbid obesity, chronic alcoholism, illegitimacy, and opioid addiction, et cetera? Right. Can you speak to that? Right, right. Well, I, th I think we, we have all been there and thought that, right, about people we know who are smoking when they shouldn't be or, or are obese or are sedentary. Um, we obviously have a very important role of personal responsibility in maintaining our health. I try to drum this into my own kids. You know, you, you get one body, you get one shot at preserving your health. Um, flossing is important, you know. Uh, all of that is true. Um, if you think back to my presentation, though, think about adverse childhood experiences, right? Think about the 40-year-old man born into a family with a, so a mother who's an alcoholic, fetal alcohol syndrome, witnessing or being exposed to child abuse, that physiological process of having your brain actually damaged by that, which is going to predispose you to less healthy behaviors. Um, I don't want to overgeneralize at all, but 
go out and ask people, if you have the guts, uh, who are extremely obese and have a series of unhealthy behaviors, just ask them if they had any childhood episode of abuse or substance abuse uh, issues. Uh, I did a story when I was at the PBS NewsHour on substance abuse in women, and I visited a substance abuse treatment facility where the director told me that almost three quarters of the women in their substance abuse programs had been sexually abused as children. Three quarters, right? So, and we know, what is substance abuse about? It's about raising dopamine levels in your brain and the, and the pleasure-seeking centers of your brain by enhancing dopamine levels, which you do if you feel terrible, right? And if you've started off in life thinking that your life is about being abused by an adult who has mastery over your fate, how much personal responsibility do you have for the fact that you are abusing substances 20 or 30 years later, right? So we have to have a balance. We have to recognize that a lot of people get set off on a course in life where the last thing they're gonna have is a sense of agency to preserve their health. We have to recognize that. We cannot wish that away. And at the same time, we have to instill in people a sense of responsibility about their health. Remember that CDC impact pyramid though. What's the least effective intervention? Counseling. <laughs> It's the least effective, right? We gotta do it. It's not ineffective, but it's the least effective. It's gotta be built on the base of addressing all these other much more fundamental drivers of health. We have a question from our colleagues at the University of Vermont uh, who, seems, who says, it seems health care is driven by the executive branch and nothing is being done by Congress. Community, county, and hospital initiatives are most welcome, but are you absolving the federal government of what should be a national effort? Oh, not in the slightest. <laughs> not, not in the slightest. Um, and I would distinguish for a moment between issues like fundamental activities around health improvement, like having you know a decent budget for the CDC and things like that, versus the other issue, set of issues, say, around health insurance coverage, et cetera. If you just look at what's happened, so we enacted the Affordable Care Act uh, in 2010 uh, because we had a very high rate of uninsured, uh, and we thought that a country that had a high rate of uninsured should address that problem, and we did it through two ways. We tried to create a much more functional individual insurance market for people who don't get coverage through their employment or don't get coverage in another way through Medicare, who have to buy it on their own. We tried to take a very dysfunctional market and make a functional one out of that. And then for people who couldn't afford that, we tried to expand the Medicaid program. And that was the two lines of action. That was going well. We, were, we had the lowest rate of uninsured that we've had in 30 or 40 years. And then we had an election. And now we have a systematic attack on, by the executive branch on almost every aspect of all of that. Uh, an effort not to continue to stabilize the individual market, an effort to destabilize the individual market, an effort that has clearly led to higher insurance premiums for people buying coverage in that market. Uh, a systematic attack on everything within the power of the executive branch to do that, and only after there was an attempt to do this congressionally last year that failed. Uh, so I'm not in the slightest absolving the federal government from this. Uh, the federal government right now is making things worse. And the real irony to me is the people being hurt the worst are the people who voted for these policies. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Think about it. And how long it takes to get people to understand uh, that this is the case, I don't pretend to know, but I hope I hope we wake up because I just don't know, you know, I, I know, I hope I persuaded you that we're not going to fix the country's problems in the healthcare system, but we sure as heck can't afford to make them any worse. And the road we're going on now is going to make it worse because it's going to make it health, health insurance much more expensive 
to people who really need it. And that's the road we're on, and uh, we, sh we need to get off that road. We need to reverse course as quickly as possible. There are a few questions. There are a few questions uh, about your organization. And uh, the uh, questioners are asking, uh, can you tell us some of the significant innovations uh, that your organization has identified and promoted to reduce costs and uh, provide improved uh, health? Absolutely, absolutely, and I'll talk about a, a couple. We have a really interesting project uh, underway at Nehi that we call Healthcare Without Walls, which is a simple way of saying that uh, healthcare is still important. We have, we have to have it, notwithstanding everything I said about how we skew our resources that way. We know we need it. Um, we know that we have built a healthcare system in this country over time that for very important reasons tended to be hospital-based. Um, we have we've created a system where we expect people to come to the system, not have the system go to them. Um, and we have, but, we, but life has changed and we have some really important opportunities now to do things in innovative ways. Um, we have telehealth. Uh, we have uh, remote monitoring capabilities. We have the whole digitization that has occurred within healthcare. One of the big problems we have in this country to this day is access to the system. And we have a maldistribution of providers. We have you know, lots and lots of doctors and specialists in particular on the East Coast and on the West Coast and in big cities and around academic medical centers. And then we have vast deserts in the country where, as we know, you can't find an OBGYN to deliver your baby in many counties in the country nowadays. Um, and that's just on that level, uh, that's partly been a, a, a problem exacerbated by malpractice, but it's not exclusively due to malpractice. It's just providers don't, aren't where some of the people are. Well, we could deal with a lot of that through expanded access and telehealth, and Dartmouth-Hitchcock, for example, is doing that. There are now, I think it's across six different specialties, uh, physicians at Dartmouth-Hitchcock who will have telehealth visits throughout New England with people coming in to local hospitals or other facilities for psychiatric care, for post-cancer uh, care treatment, et cetera. Now, this technology has been around for 50 years. Um, but the way the system was paid and organized did not lend itself to these capabilities. So we, our big Healthcare Without Walls initiative is an attempt to show people what is possible, ask why we're not doing more of this, removing the obstacles that stand in the way of it, which there are obstacles of various sorts, and essentially expanding access to people because we know we could deliver better care to more people, particularly in underserved areas of the country, and we know it could cost less. I'll just give you one other example. The University of Virginia in Charlottesville has had a telehealth program across 60 different specialties for a, more than a decade. They estimate that over that period they have saved patients in Virginia 18 million miles of driving to get to medical appointments. Uh, if you move care out of big, expensive institutions, you don't have to spend so much money on those institutions. Ask yourself how much you think the act of driving and parking contributes to your health. <laughs> right? You can pull a lot of friction out of the healthcare system that doesn't lead to better health, and we think there's a lot of potential to do that, and that's one example. Just another very quick example, we have a very important um, project now to look at uh, a wave, a tidal wave of extremely innovative drugs that are going to be coming on the market that are drugs only in a very remote sense. Most of them are efforts, frankly, to man manipulate genes uh, in various ways. And these, some of these treatments that are going to be coming down the line, we were, we're probably within a couple of years of having cures for hemophilia among other things. Um, God help us, let us hope we're on the verge of a cure for Alzheimer's. I mean, we're gonna have some very expensive, very effective drugs coming down the line, and we don't have a clue as a country how we're going to pay for them. 
And even if the prices are too high by 20% or 30% and are negotiated down, they're still not gonna be cheap. Uh, and so we have a big project now underway to think about how we will finance that in an innovative way. And I'm, I won't say more about that, but stay tuned because we will be coming out with a big report next year about some ideas we have about doing that. Uh, one more question. Is your organization in conversation with the Bezos, Dimon, and Buffett? Initiative. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Atul Gawanda, who's leading that now, is a dear old friend of mine. Um, and so, yes, in effect, I mean, they're just really getting going. And they're thinking, Atul, I know, is thinking long and hard about how you begin to make an intervention that matters in this huge, huge system. Uh, and where, you know, do you intervene? That we, th those entities that came together essentially came together largely because their employers who are paying the healthcare bills for their workers and seeing these bills go through the stratosphere and not feeling that they're getting value for the dollars they're spending. They don't see the material results in terms of the health of their employees improving and they see these costs, as I say, going through the roof. So do you, do you intervene on that end as employers? And if so, how? Do you do what many large employers are doing and basically look at healthcare uh, centers of excellence that are delivering better care than others? And do you try to send all your employees there? That's one strategy. Uh, there's an organization called the Pacific Business Group on Health that has done this for all their, all their employees. Uh, so these are big companies like Walmart, Boeing, et cetera. They agreed to send many of their employees who needed joint replacement surgery, you know, knees or hip replacement, to, for example, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, because Cleveland Clinic had great outcomes, decent prices for the procedure. What did everybody learn when they started sending their employees, including empl you know, Walmart workers from Arkansas going all the way to Cleveland for their surgery? It was produced big savings. Why? because about half the patients got put on a plane and sent back and said they don't need the surgery. <laughs> Their local docs had told them they did. Now, ask yourself, why would a local orthopedic surgeon tell somebody they needed a knee surgery? Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so these are the kinds of dynamics that employers can get involved in. So one question is, is that what this thing is gonna do? push on the employer side, or is it gonna do something else? And they don't know, they don't know. But uh, Atul is a very smart guy, and he will bring some really wonderful people around him, and I'm expecting great things. Well, you did say that high physician salaries compared to physician salaries in the rest of the world uh, were part of uh, the, uh, why it costs more to be ill here. And we've got a couple of questions. Uh, how much does our litigious society affect the cost of salaries for health care and doctors? And, um, and then how can we incentivize reducing salaries in all health care related positions uh, and still expect new doctors to pay off their student loans? Oh, right. No, uh, uh, all re great, really important questions. Okay, so uh, let's try to disentangle some of this. Okay, um, malpractice. The best estimates of what malpractice costs translate into in the higher, high, higher costs of US healthcare, one or 2%. It matters, but it's at that level, it's one or 2%. Uh, and frankly, you know, anybody who has studied this knows that we have, we, we have, we have a lot of bad stuff that happens in healthcare, you know? And is the way we currently administer that through malpractice, is that the perfect way to drive that out of the system? No, uh, but it is an adjunct to it. Now, some physicians argue that it predisposes them to do more because they want to insulate themselves against malpractice. That's unarguably true, and that's part of this one to 2% difference. Uh, so it's not to say we can't continue to attack that, uh, and, we, and, and of course, many parts of the country have done that by putting in, in ceilings on, for example, non-economic damages 
uh, that are often awarded in malpractice suits. But I think by and large, most of the, work of the entities and people who've looked into this say a tiny fraction of error in the healthcare system ends up in the malpractice system, a tiny fraction, maybe less than 10%. So there's a whole lot more error to this day going on in healthcare that doesn't end up in the malpractice system. So frankly, it tells you if we had really, really effective malpractice system, we'd, we'd be spending a whole lot more resolving malpractice lawsuits because more, many more people would file malpractice lawsuits. First of all, know that they had been injured and then hire an attorney and make it through all the hoops you have to get through to actually prosecute a case in court. So it's not a huge, it's, it's an issue, but it's not, a hu it's not the biggest issue by far in, in the cost of our system. Um, as to what we do about salaries in our healthcare system, you know, uh, as, as a, a late, the late great health economist Uva Reinhardt very famously said, in our healthcare system, a dollar of somebody's healthcare expenditure is a dollar of somebody else's healthcare income. <laughs> So anytime you try to squish down on expenditure, you are directly affecting the pocketbooks of the people who are receiving that money. And we see this in hospitals, we see this in physicians, we see this in everybody in the system. Now, and the other side of it, of course, is that you know, you'll sometimes hear the phrase, healthcare eats up 18% of the GDP. Well, that's true, but healthcare is also producing 18% of the GDP. So which side of this are you on? <laughs> Do you see it as consuming or producing GDP? It's actually producing GDP. So what do we do? If we push down on that level, we're gonna lower incomes and we're gonna lower economic activity. Raise your hand if you want your income cut, <laughs> right? That's kind of the problem we have. And the only way we ever push down prices in anything in this economy is when competition comes in and drives the prices down. Healthcare, because it is so highly regulated, because healthcare is, you know, to be a healthcare provider, you have to be licensed. I mean, healthcare providers as a group have done a really good job of keeping too many people from being licensed to be healthcare providers. Why? For lots of good reasons, right? Because you don't want everybody hanging up a shingle and pretending to be a doctor. But the effect of it has been, it's enabled them to lower prices because not everybody can be a doctor. So if you think back to the example I was giving earlier about telehealth and telemedicine, if you can start to come in and treat people in different ways than we're treating them now, maybe we can lower the price. And that's where I think Amazon is thinking there may be a future. And if you look at what Amazon has done over the last couple of years, they just bought a company called PillPack. Why? Because they are going to get into the pharmacy business. You are gonna be able to go online probably within a year or two and get your pharmaceuticals supplied by Amazon. Um, Amazon, is, is there anybody in this audience who has not bought something on Amazon? <laughs> okay. So just imagine you know, the reach of Amazon how far afield would it be to not only be able to go online and order your pills from Amazon, but to go online and have a doctor's visit on Amazon uh, or, or a pharmacist visit and say, look, uh, you know, I started taking this blood pressure medication. I'm having some side effects. Could you recommend something else? Instant video visit with a pharmacist who says, yeah, there are a couple of other things we could convert you to. I'll, I'll quickly email, I'll, I'll text your doctor, we'll get that all dealt with. And you know what? We'll get that medication delivered to you by drone in a couple of hours. <laughs> now, do you think this is going to disrupt the pharmacy sector in this country? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. And it's these kinds of disruptive, competitive entrants uh, that's been the only thing that's ever driven down prices in any aspect of our country and improved quality. I mean, remember when it was weird to have a Japanese automobile, right? Um, what did the entry of Japanese automobiles do? It forced U.S. cars to get better and cost less. 
Uh, so I think we'll see more of that coming into healthcare over the next 10 years. Will it push us down so that we are, we're spending the level of Switzerland? I don't pretend to know. I think it will have a moderating effect on prices and it's a good thing. And it will disrupt a lot of people and make a lot of people mad. And I guarantee you, you're gonna see bills introduced in Congress to ban Amazon from getting into the healthcare business just for this very reason. Uh, so we'll see. I've been increasingly aware of medical tourism. Americans going to other countries for medical procedures, including dental care, to save on costs. Can you comment on the impact of medical tourism on the delivery of our health care system? What do we know about it? And uh, uh, is it big enough to matter? It, 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 is, it is going on. It is increasing, uh, particularly as people become aware of the fact that a, a lot of health care is provided in other countries that is as high quality as in the US <clears throat> and at much lower cost. And as people get exposed, particularly to very high deductibles, uh, you know, it's not uncommon nowadays for people to have a $10,000 a year deductible on your health insurance plan if you're buying it on the individual market. And if you suddenly get hit with a, you know, a, a, a high end need, you know, a, a valve replacement, and you're on the hook for the first 10,000 of it, you may know the Federal Reserve has done a periodic surveys that show that 40% uh, of the American, pot, of American households, if they had to come up with an emergency $450 expense, would have to borrow the money because they don't have $450 to spend on an emergency basis. Now, those are the same people who have a $10,000 deductible on their health plan, right? Now, if you just feel like you got a cold coming on, well, if you've got a cold coming on, you shouldn't go to the doctor anyway, but let's say, say you don't know whether it's a bacterial infection. You're not gonna go to the doctor if you're gonna have to pay 150 bucks out of pocket for that doctor visit because it's subjected to your $10,000 deductible. Now, let's say you need a heart valve replacement. You're gonna pay 10,000 that you don't have? How is that possible? So what we know is you take, um, a, there's a big firm in India, NH is the abbreviation of the hint, long Hindu name. Um, they have hospitals in and around India, including in Bangalore, where they will do soup to nuts, valve replacement surgery, all expenses included, <laughs> including travel for about $4,000. Uh, compare that to an average cost of 60, 70, $80,000 in the United States. The hospitals are certified by the Joint Commission of the United States for safety and quality. Um, they, I, I interviewed years ago a couple, a guy in North Carolina, a, a roofer, fell off the roof, um, needed some uh, uh, emergency medical care. In the context of his workup, found he needed a heart valve replacement. Uh, his, his significant other worked for Blue Cross of North Carolina. She knew enough to know that there are different prices that people pay in the system. If you, she knew that the Blue Cross price for the procedure was $50,000. The hospital, a Duke University hospital said, because he was uninsured, he had to put up $200,000 in cash before they would do the surgery. She said, how come we can't get the discount rate? The, the, what she was told is, we do not have a system that would allow for that, meaning we don't do it. So they got on a plane and went to India. Round trip, all expenses paid, including a two-day side visit to the Taj Mahal <laughs> for less than 10,000 bucks, right? So this kind of thing, and now some insurers will pay for that, Aetna among others. Uh, they don't advertise it, but they will. So I think we will see more of that over time. Is it ever gonna be a big enough factor that will help to dampen prices in the US? I doubt it, but who knows? We have run out of time, and I've got still a huge stack of questions. So thank you all for coming. And uh, 
See you next year. Thank you. Thanks very much.